for that um, introduction. Um, so I'm going to share my uh, screen here. Can you all see? Great. Um, so I have, um, I have a, a lot of slides in this introduction, but um, sorry, in this presentation. And if you've heard me present, you know that I really like to talk, um, but please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. I, you know, I, I do aim to kind of keep this a little bit more um, conversational. Um, so with that, I'll get started. Um, so this talk examines the decade long use of redlining by federal institutions in the 20th century as an instrument to systematically and explicitly disinvest from urban neighborhoods in the United States, constraining mobility opportunities, perpetuating physical, social, and economic isolation and stratification, and enforcing the racialized residential stratification that continues to shape social inequalities in cities presently. I kind of have three big uh, messages that are maybe not um, the typical narrative that you might hear about redlining that I would kind of like to emphasize today, which is that first, it's not these maps or those maps. Um, redlining is an instrument of racial capitalism. And third, uh, we've never properly reckoned with its legacy. Um, so, all right, let's continue here. Um, a little bit about me, Juan already gave a, a very nice introduction. And so um, I'll just say that, yeah, I'm a planning student here at GSAP. Um, I studied the legacies of institutional housing discrimination on a federal level. I also use big data and computational social science to discover ways of understanding neighborhood dynamics. And these are some pretty pictures that I've made in the past. Um, so I kind of want to, yeah, kind of talk through or think through, you know, what is redlining precisely? Do we really know its history and why are its impacts still felt today? Um, on the agenda is um, kind of the origins and history of federal redlining. Um, and this is, of course, uh, uh, a focus on kind of US policies. Second, I want to talk about some of the uh, ways that the federal government has tried to unwind some of these discriminatory policies. And third, I want to talk about its present day legacies. Right. So I'm focusing the talk on the kind of the bigger picture, the so-called bigger picture narrative of federal redlining. But then there are some other aspects that are not kind of more widely addressed, which I, um, I just kind of talked about. So first, these maps, the maps that you're familiar with seeing are probably not, were probably not used for the bulk of the mortgage lending activities that we would consider federal redlining. I do still think that they're important because they're a reflection of um, the real estate and lending practices at the time. Second, um, the racialized targeting of urban neighborhoods through redlining is part of a larger ecological doctrine of neighborhood decline and revitalization that prioritize economic development and investment, which was historically influenced by ties with the private real estate industry. And third, if we take redlining areas as kind of historical indicators of housing discrimin discrimination against uh, low and minority residents, there are clear relationships um, on a national level between, um, that kind of describe socioeconomic stratification of neighborhoods over time. So the legacy of re federal redlining, as well as, as its continued practice of, as well as the continued practice of discriminatory lending through more um, sophisticated means, persists in shaping kind of uneven social spatial outcomes. And this is just um, a timeline that kind of roughly sketches out the periods of time that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, essentially starting from about um, the early 20th century there were two waves of what's called the great migration of about six million african americans from the rural south to more industrial north um, the bulk of the holc and fha's redlining activities occurred between about the mid 1930s to the 1970s 
1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act, which I'll talk about in more detail, as well as legislation um, in 1975 and 1977 that attempted to reverse some of the um, that attempted to reverse some of the redlining policies on a federal level. I'm not going to be talking about Chicago in particular, but a lot of my research does focus on Chicago. Um, and so what are the, you know, the origins and history of federal redlining? Uh, the motivation of the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, and the Homeowners Loan Corporation, the HOLC, were to bolster the economy through selectively encouraging the growth and decline of neighborhoods with, incidentally, an eye towards their own fiscal survival. Um, the, the a the HOLC and the FHA were created in 1933 and 1934, respectively, um, as the dual federal mortgage bailout and guarantor agencies created during the Roosevelt administration in the wake of the Great Depression. So between 1935 and 1962, the FHA issued, uh, insured 6.4 million new single family uh, home loans nationwide, which amounted to about $56 billion. Um, the overall US home ownership rate increased to 65% by 1995, um, from I think about like 40% in, like in the 1930s, or it might've been lower than that, um, as a consequence of what was essentially a government subsidy to homeowners. However, just 2% of government-backed loans went to Black borrowers between 1945 and 1959. Uh, both the FHA and the HOLC's refinancing and lending practices were racially contingent. Um, the FHA had a, a very extensive underwriting manual that systematized mortgage risk prediction through a formula that contained four main categories. Um, one, the condition of the property itself. Two, the quality of its location. Three, the rating of the potential borrower. And then four, the borrower's previous mortgage history. So these scores created by the FHA were subsequently translated into four lending categories, A, B, C, and D. And in the D category were areas that were uh, where the FHA would not guarantee any loans, um, thus kind of, ex and, uh, thus excluding essentially most of the inner city, much of which was um, uh, minority and low income from access to the FHA market. In fact, the FHA actually explicitly encouraged racial covenants in its underwriting manual up until 1968. So like as a side note, this um, underwriting manual is like, a 300 page document that had incredibly stringent property rating criteria that included such specific requirements as like the unit structural soundness, its livability, um, its layout and the arrangement of its rooms, its architectural attractiveness, like the ventilation of rooms, the size of floor joists, etc. I, if you can find this underwriting manual online and kind of read through it. There's some, um, <laughs> there's some like, like very floor, like florid language about like the freakish nature of architectural design and the pleasing effects of fenestration, um, which I found to be quite amusing when I was doing this research. But this all, all of which is to say that um, the goal of creating this underwriting manual was to create a set of stringent standards uh, for new housing construction. So, so a, set of, a set of stringent standards for, um, for the kinds of loans that the FHA would guarantee, but this was really targeted at new housing construction. Um, and so, you know, of course, uh, this new housing construction was mostly uh, in the suburbs and not in, um, in the, in the um, kind of inner city. So the HOLC, on the other hand, um, whose redlining maps I think are incredibly prevalent um, these days, uh, they were not responsible for extending new loans, that was the FHA's role, but they were responsible for bailing out 
underwater loans between a very short time period, 1933 and 1935. The HOLC made over a million um, refinance loans, but the value of these loans were um, only about three billion. So really, it was the FHA's lending activities that accounted for the vast majority of government guarantee, uh, mortgage guarantees and government um, mandated federal redlining. So due to the high volume of loan applications and the FHA's confidence in its own appraisers who are mem members of the local real estate industry, to properly determine mortgage risk. And so as I kind of mentioned previously, all the criteria for, uh, for, for providing mortgage loans were very stringent. However, um, members of the local real estate industry would kind of first go out um, into these neighborhoods and make an overall assessment of the property's grade. And they did this using the FHA's own maps. And so this is an example. And, and these grades, by the way, they hardly change from the initial assessment using these maps. So we can um, properly consider these maps, these FHA maps, to be kind of the, the, the actual uh, redlining maps. However, most of these maps were actually destroyed in a court case that I believe was against the FHA's racially discriminatory practices. The one in Chicago is one of the few FHA redlining maps that I have found to still exist. Um, and this is kind of getting more into my own research. The, there is a difference between the FHA and the HOLC maps, which I'm just kind of going to show you um, as a comparison. My own research suggests that the FHA maps may have actually been a little bit more uh, stringent, or the impacts of the FHA maps were a little bit uh, larger than what the HOLC maps might suggest. But um, I'm actually, I, I won't talk about my own research that much because it gets a little bit funky. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I actually really am curious why on your speculations or findings or thoughts of on why, what drove that differences? Was it the engagement of the local real estate brokers or sector appraisers in the initial outset? I, I don't want to divert it too much, but I also sure. I'm curious. Um, yeah, I, so basically I think what, um, what, why you see more of an effect with the FHA maps is because they are actually used. And so they kind of like, there's more of like a, like a, direct relationship between, you know, the, the lack of home, like, you know, lower home ownership rates, lower home value, um, you, know, you know, higher uh, racial segregation in the FAG maps, right? So if we kind of wanted to assess the impact of, you know, so-called redlining, this is kind of like a more direct uh, picture of what actually happened, whereas these, um, these are kind of more speculation. Um, and so the reason why the impact is greater is because it was a thing that was actually used. Um, whereas if you, if we do use these maps, they're, they, they are more speculative. So for instance, like in Chicago and this kind of, in, in, on the South side, I think there was like speculation that these neighborhoods would deteriorate more. Um, but because you can see that like, you know, uh, these were like kind of rated better. There, there's like a divergence between what was, uh, speculated and what actually happened. Uh, yeah. That's so, so fascinating. So all this policy talk about using redlining maps to kind of hypothetically, ideally, maybe someday start yes. to be connected <laughs> <laughs> to differential levels of subsidy and support or rebuilding, et cetera, um, would be using the wrong maps or not, not the strongest yeah. maps. Uh, yeah, precisely. Um, precisely. I think, you know, I, there's only one map that I found in Chicago. Um, you know, we don't know, if, like in, in smaller cities, for instance, there might be like a more, um, you know, these two maps are more similar. I can only really say for Chicago that it's different and it seems like that difference matters. Um, but I don't really know for other cities. But yes, I mean, so, so on the one hand, like if we're going to talk about kind of direct causal relationships between like, you know, federal government redlining and kind of, and all the kind of stratified impacts today, 
the HOLC map is, is, is a proxy, right? It's probably a good enough one. You can see these are probably similar enough. Um, and also because they were created by kind of um, like local real estate, um, um, you know, assessors, it does reflect something about, like, you know, about local real estate practices, right? It's just not the federal redlining maps. Okay, um, more questions? Okay. Go back to some of the history here. Um, I, by the way, I, I love reading about um, kind of our, our uh, <laughs> The U.S.'s uh, real estate history, so I kind of like spent some time digging up these images. Um, but basically, you know, so the origins of single-family home ownership has its roots in the 20th century, like the early 20th century. Um, then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover took advantage of an already existing own your own home own your own home campaign, which was created by the Department of Labor, but actually inspired by the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which is kind of like the, the association of like private real estate, um, of private real uh, realtors. Um, and so this was a, a campaign created in 1917 and it aggressively pushed home ownership. Um, the motivation of the campaign was twofold. Uh, first, it aimed to create an attachment to property in the nuclear family in order to dissuade citizens' communist sympathies, um, the fear of which was a widespread during the period after World War I. Um, second, it aimed to bolster the construction of housing, especially in partnership with the private real estate industry. This, it was believed, could promote a modern technocratic and decentralized industrialization process and stem the economic downturn during the depression. So uh, from 1924 to 1940, if you, read, if you read Article 34 of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers uh, Realtor Code of Ethics, it would read, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood, i.e. minorities. Or actually, you know, around this time, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just kind of uh, a black residents that were considered um, members detrimental to property values. It was actually also, um, um, immigrants and like Jews and Italians as well. So what uh, what was considered, you know, kind of like a minority or an undesired um, um, population has, uh, has, you know, shifted. And ethnicity was a much more, uh, was, is, you know, also an important factor in kind of um, these designations. So redlining practices didn't originate from the federal government, but was largely influenced by existing private real estate practices and beliefs. Um, prior to the creation of federal mortgage underwriting institutions, the, NAA, the NAREB had already established their own guidelines and statistical maps for evaluating neighborhood character um, in its code of ethics. These guidelines were followed by local real estate boards and governments which disseminated local maps and other appraisal tools during the housing boom in the 1920s and into the depression. So these tools and guidelines, which influence later FHA and HOLC practices, again, originated from private interests. The driving principle was the preservation of neighborhood land value and an acceptance of the kind of urban ecology theories of neighborhood decline that was prominent at the time. So, you know, the, 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 the goal of the FHA and the HOLC was to encourage home ownership because they believed that this, uh, like this, this uh, nuclear family framework was actually a much more sound investment. So these, I'm going to quickly just talk about urban ecology theories. So these urban ecology theories were adopted by um, the FHA's economist, Homer Hoyt, who was actually a real estate speculator himself. And he was the principal architect of the FHA's appraisal methods. 
um, as a real estate economist writing his dissertation on land value change in Chicago, um, Hoyt's research, especially his interest in mapping citywide racial, economic, and transportation dynamics, had the aim of developing future land value projections and identifying areas and stages of decline. So this justified racial housing segregation as a determining factor of real estate values kind of given its prevalence. And previous research by um, John Metzger, who I think is a Columbia planning PhD grad, um, suggests an explicit tie between race, land value, and decline by suggesting the FHA and subsequent federal housing agencies accepted the inevitability of decline employing a practice of so-called planned abandonment to catalyze faster devaluation of urban black neighborhoods and directing resources to support neighborhoods that were not already in decline. Um, one of the reasons why a direct causal relationship between uh, redlining and segregation and social stratification is complicated is because there are other large interventions that also targeted poor minority neighborhoods. So I feel like I need to talk about the roughly contemporaneous kind of urban renewal and public housing uh, 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 interventions that took place. So despite the kind of widespread impact of FAJ's policies, systematic racialized disinvestment was not limited to federal redlining. The Housing Act of 1949 and the, Inter and the Interstate Highway Act of 1956 collectively formed the urban interventions uh, considered um, as urban renewal. So though urban renewals, renewal efforts were largely considered uneven and a slow process with like a very limited physical legacy, there is general consensus uh, regarding its use as a destructive instrument of Negro, Negro removal. So well documented are its demolitions of existing neighborhoods in predominantly minority and low income areas, displacing residents and reducing the overall low income housing supply and also its role in perpetuating racial segregation through the construction of public housing in mainly black neighborhoods. So using Chicago as a case study, um, Albert Hirsch argues that there was an explicit effort by city officials, business interests, civic leaders, and white residents to address the issue of the growing black population during the Great Migration and to contain these uh, uh, populations in existing black neighborhoods through public housing, which Hirsch calls a domestic containment policy. Um, so this is kind of like our sordid history of, you know, redlining and, you know, federal disinvestment in, uh, in, in, in our, uh, our, our, you know, our urban neighborhoods. Um, the next section, I kind of want to talk about some of the policies to un, so-called unwind these discriminatory practices and how they've been quite uh, uh, messy and, and kind of heterogeneous. So first of all, um, we all kind of probably know about the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which legislatively banned discriminatory housing practices. There's actually a general consensus that it was either insufficiently stringent or it actually encouraged poor lending practices. Um, in particular, Section 235 of the 1968 Housing Act, which was intended to, supposedly intended to help middle and lower income buyers to revise FHA lending, was considered a failure due to its uh, lax underwriting standards. So the, the lack of oversight over lenders, and in particular, the lack of attention on the racial patterns of their lending, results in the creation of what Dan Emmerich calls a dual market, in which black borrowers have faced the same abusive lending practices that they formerly faced through more kind of informal means, but they were just now institutionalized. Um, and and Kiana uh, Yamada Taylor talks about that um, in her book. So one of the reasons why I'm studying Chicago and why Chicago is an interesting case study is that it's actually the birthplace and testing ground for some of the national legislation to reverse redlining practices. Throughout the 1960s and into the 1970s, organizations like 
uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Contract Buyers League in Chicago. Um, this is an image of um, their protest outside of the real estate office. Uh, made extensive attempts to challenge discriminatory housing practices in Chicago on a local grassroots level. Um, these efforts provided uh, the first kind of like irrefutable evidence that demonstrated housing discrimination um, in Chicago. And this evidence and the National People's Action Coalition and the National uh, Training and Information Center provided a catalyst for the eventual passage of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act of 1975 and the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. Thank you, um, yeah, you've, you've talked about how these practices were both created by uh, realtors and property investors, but the whole system to preserve property values uh, centered around whiteness was also well, institut institutionalized by the federal government to a very large extent. Was, were these grassroots efforts directed at, at the two of them? Like, was that relation apparent at the time? Or this is an understanding that we have achieved with time? So are you saying like, is the rec was the recognition that this was existing on a federal level apparent at yeah. the time? Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so, right? It was, it was very much apparent at the time. In fact, um, and I, you know, I didn't intend to go into a lot of detail about this, but essentially the only way, because it was impossible to get um, a, federal, uh, a federal loan to buy a home, the only way that a lot of um, these, I mean, in Chicago, mostly black residents, to buy a home was through contract lending, right? In which basically you as a white, um, you know, person with means could buy the home and then extend a so-called contract, which is basically this kind of like agreement between you and the, you know, and the black borrower. Um, so you, you could then extend a loan to the black borrower and usually you would kind of, um, the, the, house, the quality of the housing stock wasn't great. You have no incentive to kind of maintain um, um, the home, um, you could basically recall the contract um, af you know, after you've decided that you've gotten enough kind of payments from, from the contract. And so this, these contracts were actually, it, it, there's kind of like an interesting parallel between um, these kind of earlier contracts and like, you know, and, and, and mortgage-backed securities. And what's like, in that like, these contracts were essentially traded like like um, like bonds, right? So they were basically guarantees that you would get some payments, or you could like extract some payments for like you know for a year or two, and then you could just um, for whatever reason renege on the contract, and um, and they were considered like investment opportunities, which is all to say the reason why um, you know this existed is because it was very apparent um, that this was kind of like a, like a federal, a government level institutionalized kind of race, uh, racist um, practice against homeowners. And they were, um, you know, they, had, they, they knew themselves that they had no access to these markets. Um, right, but, um, but I think it's, I think it's so um, powerful at the same time that, you know, kind of, uh, despite these um, kind of like large scale efforts to, um, to shut out, uh, you know, residents from home ownership and despite these um, kind of widespread practices of, you know, contract lending, that nevertheless, there was enough um, kind of grassroots level organization in Chicago to eventually spur, you know, national level um, changes. I mean, this was not the only thing that, you know, that, that, that created this kind of national level legislation to reverse redlining, but I just find that, like, you know, this is, um, yeah, it, it's powerful. Um, so, so, yeah, so kind of as I was saying before, there are two kind of, there are two pieces of legislation, um, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and then the Community Reinvestment Act. 
And the Community Reinvestment Act in 1977 is considered like the uh, redlining reversal legislation. And this is uh, targeted at low income, low income communities and requires banks to make loans where they take deposits. So the, it, it's considered that these two pieces of legislation has had you know, a significant impact on lending in these minority and low income neighborhoods. However, their overall effectiveness towards the goal of reversing residential stratification and segregation um, has, it has kind of been very heterogeneous because first of all, because these laws have changed substantially over time. Um, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act until 1990 didn't require banks to, um, to, to include demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. To this day, there's still um, significant um, parts of the data that are missing that demographic and socioeconomic information. And there is research showing that it's like missing more in black neighborhoods. Um, the CRA um, has also not entirely been effective. Um, first of all, bank regulators have differentially enforced the CRA over time. And there's also like a lot of geographic variation in, in its enforcement. Um, Furthermore, it also remains a question whether the CRA actually enabled the riskier subprime mortgage lending practices that caused the 2008 financial market crisis. Um, the CRA also only applies to banks and not other non-bank mortgage lenders. And these non-bank mortgage lenders actually originate most of the subprime loans. Would they originate Ted, I should say, most of the subprime loans in the early to mid 2000s. And these non-bank mortgage lenders still represent like six of the top 10 mortgage lenders in the US. And furthermore, there is like very, uh, the penalty for a violation of the CRA is quite weak. So banks um, have to get these CRA bank ratings but they're actually only important when banks are applying for a merger. And so, I mean, it's still kind of debated to this day, like, you know, how can we make, how can we improve the CRA? But this is just to kind of show that the process of trying to, at least like the legislative process of trying to undo and reverse um, redlining has been messy and met with resistance. Um, so what are some of the present day legacies? Um, kind of, as I mentioned before, because there are all these like contemporaneous large scale government interventions between 1930s, between the 1930s and the 1960s. So there was like redlining and urban renewal and, and, and public housing and, you know, um, et cetera. It's kind of difficult to isolate a direct like, causal relationship between redlining and kind of more contemporary uh, racial stratification. There is some research that does show that using the HOLC map um, that shows that um, the HOLC maps influence redlining and like, you know, of influence home equity, home values and racial segregation in redlined neighborhoods. Um, however, I think if we widen the definition, or if we kind of, if we consider like a wider concept of discriminatory federal housing practices, I think it's pretty clear that there are links between, um, you know, these practices and racial and socioeconomic stratification. Um, the clearest connection is probably through an examination of the racial wealth gap, um, according to the Brookings Institute, the average white household had a net worth of $171,000 um, in 2020, while the average black household had only about $17,000. So that's almost 10 times as less. Um, housing is not only a family's largest asset, but also due to the nature of housing and kind of its long duration, the long duration of mortgage loans. It's also an asset that homeowners keep for a long time. So the effect of differential access to housing naturally just has long 
long-term consequences for residents and neighborhoods. So this can be especially amplified given, so yeah, given the durability of housing, but also um, how, so, so moreover, uh, housing discrimination has historically constrained mobility through the racial exclusion of black and other minorities from the suburbs, which limited opportunities to kind of build home equity, but also secure employment in these areas as jobs migrated out to the suburbs and as kind of um, um, cities deindustrialized from you know, the 1960s to like the 1990s. Um, in terms of the impacts on neighborhoods, the exclusion of largely minority residents and neighborhoods from becoming homeowners catalyze processes of neighborhood disinvestment and the concentration of poverty through the lack of capital to invest in housing itself, but also the surrounding, ur uh, surrounding urban fabric. Um, the economic isolation resulting from neighborhood segregation both causes and amplifies the effects of pre-existing economic inequality and the social isolation of poor black residents leaves them without a social buffer, um, which is William Julius, Wilson, William Julius Wilson's term, um, which, support, which can support and affirm um, you know, a, a, a residents in the neighborhood. And this is typically, um, and these kind of social buffers typically exist in kind of more diverse uh, communities. Or at least I, I, I guess like, you know, socioeconomically diverse communities. Um, this is just a chart, this is for Chicago, but this is a chart showing kind of throughout from the 1930s to 2010, the stratification along demographic and socioeconomic lines of the different redlined neighborhoods. And these are FHA redlined neighborhoods in Chicago. So you can see that, for instance, this chart here shows um, home ownership between 1930 and 2010, and areas that were uh, redlined at the worst grade, D grade, have persistently had lower rates of home ownership, you know, in this 80 year, 80 year, 90 year time span. The median home value of these neighborhoods have persistently been low until about 1980. My suspicion is that this kind of sharper rise in home ownership is actually due to gentrification. And so thus you're, you're kind of starting to draw some links between historical redlining and kind of more present day gentrification. Um, there are kind of other factors that I can talk um, about a little bit. Uh, more, but I'm going to just skip that for now. I think that uh, Bernadette, yeah. Just wanted to interject for all and for you to clarify this is your own findings and research. Yeah. And as <laughs> are almost all the slides that don't have uh, an attribution below. So we are at the cutting edge of <laughs> almost to be published research in a big journal. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and so this is, this is from my, this is from my own research. Yeah. Um, but this is this is other people's research. So um, the, I just did like a quick, uh, you know, Google search of the relationships between redlining and um, kind of various impacts. So you can see that, and, and I think all of these were published in like the last um, year or, or two. But I think that here. You know, off the top of my head, here are some of the like, various aspects of kind of long-term dis discrimination and disinvestment in neighborhoods, right? There are environment and health uh, aspects. There obviously the racial wealth gap and income inequality, economic and social isolation, educational and kind of childhood outcomes, the constraints of economic opportunities, this creation and the continuation of a dual housing market. Um, gentrification and displacement vulnerabilities, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to kind of end uh, with, with kind of two resources, um, which I hope will allow you to kind of think about uh, redlining and its impact kind of on a more local level. So the first, um, and two, two tools, two mapping tools. Um, the first is, um, uh, a University of Richmond, they have, they were the ones who uh, 
digitized and georeferenced um, all of these historical HLC redlining maps and, and have uh, kind of created all the, you know, this kind of um, boom of like redlining research that you, sh uh, that you saw previously. And I think what's really, um, and maybe what I'll do here is I'll actually just, um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to this tool. I think what's really interesting about um, this tool is that not only does it have the original, um, not only does it have these uh, re original redlining uh, maps, so you can kind of like zoom around in Brooklyn, um, and I'm just gonna go here to uh, Harlem and click on this neighborhood here. But not only does it have the original redlining maps, you can kind of click through, but you can also see the area description. So these um, these uh, uh, assessors went to every single neighborhood with this form. And this form, um, so they had to kind of like fill out this form for all the kind of characteristics and aspects that would help you decide what grade to give this neighborhood. And you can see in kind of like detail the estimated annual family income, whether or not there was a uh, a black population, what they thought the black population was, the kinds, like the, 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 the urban fabric of the neighborhood at the time. And then lastly, they have these kind of like clarifying remarks that I find totally fascinating because it provides like a, like a window into how they thought about these neighborhoods. Um, rents are not low due to great crowding, um, you know, Formerly a good, so Harlem, formerly a good residential district with many well-built private homes, now practically entirely Negro with many tenements. Um, so I, I, I find that uh, quite interesting. And then the second is just um, a tool that I have created um, and I'll just go there right now. And it allows you to explore the redlining maps as well, but the focus is more on looking at the, um, the, 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 the socioeconomic and demographic changes of these redlined areas over time. So for instance, um, this is the redlining map of Cleveland, and you can see here that this is the 2016 um, breakdown or a uh, uh, map of the black population in Cleveland. And you can see that they kind of map onto each other quite well. And here you can see um, this over time, uh, these areas over time and how, you know, these um, census characteristics have just been persistently kind of stratified. And so if we look at uh, median household income, for instance, over time. The areas that were redlined red um, have just persistently had lower levels of um, income, where the areas that were redlined green have just persistently had higher levels of, um, of income. So we can really start to understand how, how, how static, not, yeah, how, how persistent some of these characteristics can be. And um, I, I don't know about this, like the, the, the kind of the scientific, like causal impacts, but you can see that neighborhoods and neighborhood characteristics don't seem to kind of change very much often. And I would argue that this is um, a lot due to our kind of our, 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 our governmental legacy of discriminatory housing in the US. Um, so I think I'm just gonna end it there. I feel like I've um, talked a lot um, and I'm thankful for all, all the people who have asked questions and interrupted, but perhaps more of you have, uh, have questions. Um, yeah, Bernadette's clapping and I uh, applaud the, the, 
sentiment as well. Uh, thank you, Wenfei, for this wonderful talk. Uh, this last piece was amazing, I think, not only because of how you, you've created these visualizations, but because you've taken these uh, maps that perhaps could be interpreted as, as you said at the beginning, as some sort of speculative tool that was used during the 20th century, but to frame them in a way that they show not only racial segregation, but they show the deep cracks in a system uh, of social mobility that is not functioning and that in over time and over several decades has uh, reproduced the same results, at least in terms of housing and in terms of uh, chronic disinvestment at both the federal and, and the local levels. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, and also like this is really just the beginning. These maps were only digitized a few years ago, right? And there, and there are so many of them. What I find to be, what I, what I like, like to do is to kind of really zoom in to neighborhoods that I know well and to kind of understand what are the kind of the, 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 the local impacts and the local legacies of these kind of large scale interventions. If, if anyone has questions for Wenfei, please feel free to just raise your hands. Uh, you can also type them in chat if you're more comfortable with that. I guess I have a kind of a reflection. Oh, Jenna, why are you talking? Oh, no, go ahead, Bernadette. Oh, I was just going to say, um, well, thanks for your uh, presentation, Wednesday. This is super informative. Um, I was just curious how in your current research kind of looking at, I guess, um, persisting effects of redlining in the present day, how you can account for other kind of large projects or investments that might have also shaped the trajectory of different neighborhoods like urban renewal projects or something that like clearly left a large um, yeah. dent on the urban fabric? Um, that's a good question. And it's really, it's really hard, right? Because you kind of have to both have the data and you have to kind of do some causal analysis, which as you know, Jenna is like, you know, in the social sciences is uh, you know, nearly impossible to like really get deep. Um, you kind of have to have like the right experimental setting for that. Um, but I think there's some, you know, there's some ways to think about it. Like, you know, if we know that there are areas um, that were destroyed because of urban renewal, that's an intervention that you can then have, right? And obviously this would be a lot easier to do if you just focus in kind of like one city or like yeah. Um, it, so, so if you can, if you know like when and where these interventions happen, you can like start to trace them out, and then look at whether or not there were some changes in, you know, for instance, if you if were using like census data, for instance, whether or not there was um, changes in like you know home value, population distribution, etc. Um, nobody that I know has um, thus far kind of successfully done this on a national level. Um, I might try to attempt something like this in a future <laughs> research project. Um, this is kind of the, like, the, the question, the, like the question that I'm thinking about in my own research. Thanks. Yeah. There was a question in the chat. Um... Yeah, I think that's a, um, and the, the question is about rental markets versus home ownership markets. And I actually think that's like also another one of like the more important aspects of this question that are really difficult to, um, to, to answer. Um, so essentially, you know, this is kind of like a, like a longitudinal historical research, which if you ask any kind of like the historical social scientists, they'll tell you it's like not easy. 
Um, but right, so of course, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the black minority kind of um, um, inner city residents that we're talking about, they don't, they did not live in homes that they owned, they mostly rented, right? Um, the FHA did have, did provide multifamily loans, but that was a much smaller portion of their, um, uh, of their loan guarantees. Um, I know that there are some FHA maps in the National Archives that looks at um, like rentals and the, um, the, the various kind of, uh, they're like risk maps of, of rentals, but I don't really know if there's kind of like good longitudinal rental data, um, or at least like that's, you know, that hasn't been like kind of an area of focus for me, but it, it, it is true that, you know, like if you're, um, um, for kind of certain racial, uh, like low income groups, you are not likely going to be homeowners. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm burning. Yeah. All right, I'm full of questions. First of all, this is such a fascinating thing, and I've heard you speak about your own research before, and to hear you step back and to reframe the whole thing, I've everything you said was new to me, it was um, pretty much, and it was just amazing and fabulous so thank you and stay tuned for her articles and books and other websites folks um, but I don't know just thinking and reflecting how you started speaking about how local practices were baked and crystallized into national policy and then how that national policy kind of reinforced and lasted and has had these impacts and mu much of the policy talk now is about national policy changes theoretically like targeting formerly redlined areas um, and I wonder what ways we as researchers, as practitioners, can make clear the ongoing local practices that continue to intersect with national policy. So I don't know, it just occurred to me as you were speaking, you know, what if we looked at a formerly redlined area and got all the, her, you know, Lance, the non-fair housing ads on Craigslist and the ways that they say students welcome and um, other things uh, and the ways or languages that real estate agents use, you know, you might want to consider a family friendly neighborhood or, you know, folks where you'll feel at home and all of these other things that are hard to capture but are super widespread still and map them onto a single area. Like here's the stack right now and here are the historical traces from that stack. Um, I'm sure people have done that, but I don't know, it makes me think what can we do at the housing lab to start to think about how to unpack and disassemble, if we can be so bold, redlining and may, may just make it clear for our area right here, Manhattanville. I don't know. Yeah, actually, um, when, what can we do for you? Subject. <laughs> actually, when Juan, when, when Juan and I were emailing uh, a few days ago about the presentation, I was like, I am going to talk about redlining in Harlem. I actually, like, so most of my work is kind of like on this large scale and it's like quantitative and etc. But I find that, you know, I find that you can, like, I can only get so far in terms of how I want to describe neighborhood impacts. And that's why I really wanted to kind of like think very locally in terms of like how some of these, like what, 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 what is the trace of these policies, not necessarily through, um, you know, like census characteristics, but what is the trace in terms of its impact on the social fabric or like, you know, communities. And so that kind of, um, I think motivates my desire to kind of dig in more locally and kind of really study the history of, you know, how, um, how, how some of these housing practices have affected residents and communities like in Harlem, how has it changed some of the, you know, the, the community institutions in Harlem, how has it changed um, some of the, you know, some of the, um, like the, the, the physical, like, you know, urban fabric of the neighborhood. Um, what are some kind of like, you know, like ethnographic stories that we can, like, you know, we can, we can tease out um, from, you know, this kind of like this large scale uh, legislation. So for me, like, that's actually like, that's, it's quite interesting. Um, I don't, I don't personally, I feel like I have the capacity or the ability to kind of know where to start, but like that's, that's where I ideally kind of like want to take some of this research. 
Well, uh, again, one faith. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, we need to finish the discussion here, but we uh, invite you to keep tuning in to our weekly conversation series. Next Friday, we will be talking with Cecily King about affordable housing and equity. Uh, also, uh, if you want to get in touch with the lab, you can uh, uh, shoot us an email in our brand new email address, gsaphousinglab at columbia.edu. Uh, there is uh, some publications that we have been putting up on the GSAP website that you can also check out. Uh, and finally, we are um, uh, receiving feedback on a website that we are co collecting some resources called Housing And to try to map and understand uh, all these uh, concepts that keep popping up in our chats and in the research that we've been putting out. So any type of feedback or comment or gap that you think we need to fill, uh, we, were, we would be happy to discuss. Uh, so again, thank you very much and we'll see you next Friday. Thanks all, this is fun.